Uh, but hey, it is good to be here. As Rowan said, um, I am, I, it's like coming back home a bit, although home has changed tremendously. Um, when I was here, the cafeteria was like a small garage. Um, yeah, does anybody, does anybody even know what building it was in? I see one hand going, yeah. You guys have it great, man. Like, you guys are living large. You know, we had like nothing. So, uh, but it is good to be back. And um, I love this topic of identity. Like, for me, like the, the college years, uh, there is no greater pressing issue that you are going through, really from the end of middle school through high school and really through the end of college than identity formation. And like identity is so central to who we are, right? Like, like it, is, it is so central. It, it is kind of emanates from the core of us, that, that, that the core of who you are, that identity piece is really what pushes forth the rest of your life. The clothes you wear, the people you hang out with, the, the, the major you selected, everything comes from that core. It pushes out from inside. And, and really, your life is a consequence of what has been cultivated as your identity. And so to me, this is unbelievably huge because, again, like that formation period, because it transforms your life, because it shapes who you are, it shapes how you view the world, is that piece, because it's so essential, it only makes sense to, to pause and take a look at what's going on inside. That we live from the inside out. And it's so like, essential that we, we stop and we reflect on this. Right? And, and really the reality is, is most of us never do that. Most of us, identity kind of happens to us. And then from that, we, we allow it to shape us. We become who we are. And then one day we're like, who in the world am I? Right? And, and so some of you guys are going through that question. It, it plays itself out all over the place. Uh, if you were to see, I, I tried really hard to find a picture of me in middle school, uh, but my parents apparently don't love me because they didn't have one. So I don't know exactly what happened there, but, but it, like you most experience this at middle school, do you not? Like does anyone like think back of who they were in middle school and just like cringe? Yeah, like awful, awful period of life, right? You honestly, if someone offered me a million dollars to go back to middle school, I would never, ever say yes. Like, I am glad that those years are behind me, right? Is you, you experience it, you sense it, you, you change from like one day to the next in middle school, right? Like, like for me, I, uh, at Del Oro, which no one's ever heard of, um, I, uh, I played basketball for four years, uh, and, and loved it. I grew up as a kid. Like, I remember going to games and seeing the high school. I was like, man, I wanted to play basketball when I was in high school. Like, I wanted to play for Del Oro. And so, like, as I grew up, that began to shape who I was. So I began to go to their kind of camps and whatnot, and, and I began to try to act the part. And, and when I was in high school, way back in my day, uh, when I was in high school, like, like R&B and, like, rap and hip-hop, like, that was huge. Like, it was, like, basketball culture and, like, R&B, rap, hip-hop culture were, like, meshed. Okay, now, I grew up in Loomis, all right? So I'm, like a goofy country bumpkin white kid, all right? That was like me. But I could, if there was enough money on the table, which there probably isn't in this room, I could probably wrap all of Usher's confessions, all right? <laughs> I probably could. But that doesn't quite sync up where if you knew me, you're like, what in the world? Uh, but I could flow a little bit, a little bit, all right? So I could drop that. But, but the, the point is this, is that because my core, my identity was I wanted to play basketball in high school, that began to shape who I was. It transformed the things I was interested in. It shaped the way I dressed. It shaped the, way, the music I listened to, the people I hung out with. All of that came from an internal kind of core. And, and this process is really, is the reality is that it's, it's pressed onto us by culture. Every culture across history has had a process of identity formation. Okay, no one ever calls it that. Cultures don't say this is how you become who you are. But it is impressed upon us. Okay, is that this identity formation process is pressed upon us. For me, if I was to be a basketball player, there were certain things I had to do to look the part. And so the culture told me, this is what you do. This is what has value. This is what is effective. This is what's successful. So do those things so you can accomplish this. And so our culture, right, is constantly impressing this sense of what identity is. And this plays out in, in tremendous ways. This plays out in academics. They say, get, get straight A's, because if you don't get straight A's, you're never going to get the job, and you're never going to survive, right? Or, or they say athletics. It's like, be the best in, in, you, know, you can be, is if you aren't the top of your class, if you're not number one on the, on the, on the golf team, on the cross country, whatever it is, if you're not those things, you're not worthy, right? And, and so it pressed itself on in so many ways. We see it through our mu music, our media, everything. Is it, this idea presses in on us, and it's so strong, 
It's so strong that we don't even recognize it. So what I want to do to start is I want to just give you some examples of what I have seen kind of in, uh, or actually I want, to, I want to look at historically, okay, how identity formation has happened, how now modern, what I was kind of just explaining, and then I want you to see just how it's the air we breathe, that the culture is propelling this. So historically, okay, from almost any non-Western culture, the way identity formation takes place is you're born into a family, and your role then is what serves the greater good. Okay, so you are a mother or a father or a brother or a sister. That's like your number one role, regardless of what's going on inside you. That's your role. So your family is into carpentry, so you're a carpenter, right? Like, and that's it. Like, it doesn't matter what you feel. It doesn't matter what's in your heart. That's who you are. That's, you sacrifice your kind of core, what you believe, your desires. You suppress them for the cause of the greater good. And so historically, that's how for centuries, that's how identity was shaped. That's where you found value. That's where you found worth is if you lived into the greater good of the community, okay? And the enlightenment happened and, and rationalistic thinking and that kind of exploded everything. And now our culture has really reversed this. Okay, we say things like follow your heart, right? We say chase your dreams, right? And, and we say things where instead, now it's not deny yourself for the cause of the greater good, but the way you have worth and value is when you take well, those desires and what's inside you and you let those kind of self-actualize. And if those come to fruition, if those desires are what push you and propel you, that is where you find identity. So instead of now culture telling us what we should be, we are saying no one can tell you what you can be except yourself, right? And let me explain a few examples that um, you may know, who knows, um, but I want to look at music and movies to find out where we first kind of sense this. So, so let me tell you, uh, first of all, these first two examples, uh, they're not who I normally listen to. Uh, but they're good examples, so don't hold it against me. Uh, but yet somehow I knew them, so maybe I do listen to them. So uh, the first one, let me know if you, if you recognize this song. Do you know that there's still a chance for you because there's a spark in you? You just got to ignite the light and let it shine. Just own the night like the 4th of July because, baby, you're a firework. All right, then the last one, come on, show them what you're worth. Right, like the whole idea is, is the great theologian Katy Perry is saying there is a... <laughs> There is a light in you, right? All you have to do is ignite it. And then I love that last line, right? She says, come on, show them what you're worth. She says that light in you, if you ignite that, if that shoots off like the 4th of July, then you'll show them what your worth is, right? This is like individualism 101 is saying whatever's in you, that's what the world is going to value, right? Uh, next one, <laughs> don't hold it against me. All right, I stay up too late, got nothing in my brain. That's what people say. That's what people say. <laughs> I go on too many dates, but I can't make them stay. At least that's what people say. That's what people say. But I keep cruising. Can't stop. Won't stop. Right? Can't stop. Won't stop moving. It's like I got this music in my mind saying it's going to be all right because the player is going to play, 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 play. The haters, they're going to hate, 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 hate. <laughs> and baby, I'm just going to shake, 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 shake it off. Right? But the whole thing, right, is, is <laughs> told you, don't hold it against me, all right? Uh, but the whole idea between, or by my friend T. Swizzle is that <laughs> everyone is telling us something, but we can't listen to them. We got to shake that off, right? It's saying that everything that's going on around us, they can't, they have no right to tell me anything, all right? Let's switch to movie, or actually one more, just to show you I do listen to other music um, than pop, I guess. I don't know. Um, John Lennon's Imagine. A okay, beautiful song, right? But listen to it. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us and above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. He's saying, imagine if there was nothing that could or press us down. Imagine that no one could tell you what to do. There's no heaven. There's no hell. There's no consequence. You can just be who you are. Right? Like that is, it's the air we breathe. It's everywhere around us, right? Let's go movies. Uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Okay, good. I was a little worried. I'm like, I'm kind of old now. Um, so I was a little worried, but you got it, right? right? The whole thing is him saying, listen, I want to be who I want to be, so I'm going to go off and have this fantastic day. And it is a great movie, so it's okay, though. But that's like the idea of it. You know what I mean? Uh, next one, Divergent, right? The whole thing is Tris saying, I'm not who culture tells me I am. The whole thing is saying, no, I might be this, but no, I'm divergent, so I'm going to go and, and do whatever she does. I've seen it once. I don't know. But, you know what I mean? That's the idea. That's the idea, all right? Let's go. Um, in my realm, I have a four-year-old daughter at home, uh, and so everything in the world 
is princesses, all right? That's just life, okay? Um, and so the, the Little Mermaid, going back a little bit, okay, wow, L- real fans of Little Mermaid. Okay, so think about it, Little Mermaid, 100% of the story is about this girl who rebels against her dad, all right? So my daughter started watching this, <laughs> yeah, this didn't fly long in my house, all right? And she really loves enacting these things. So, so as she kind of was watching this, she begins to think, no, I'm not going to listen to what my dad says. I want to go fall in love with Eric, right? That's his name, Eric. It's like, I'm going to go, I'm going to give my soul to essentially the devil. Let's be honest. Okay. <laughs> Ursula is pretty much the devil and says, I'm going to listen to what I want and no one else. Okay. One more example um, and cry it out if you know this one. It's funny how some distance makes everything seem small. And the fears that once controlled me can't get to me at all. It's time to see what I can... Yeah, I'll attack Frozen. I'll do it. All right? It's time to see what I can do to test the limits and break through. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. Let it go, let it go. Can't hold it back anymore. Let it go, let it go. Turn away and slam the door. I don't care what they're going to say. Let the storm rage on. The cold never bothered me anymore. All right? I think about it. Like, there is no greater anthem to individualism then let it go, right? Like, honestly, like, it's Elsa saying, listen, no rules for me. Don't tell me what to do. I'll be whoever I want to be. I'll freaking freeze this whole town if I want to, right? Like, that's like Elsa. And what happens, and I listen to, I, I personally, Frozen was all right the first 50 times. After I had to watch it after that, it got bad. I don't mind Little Mermaid. I don't mind Divergent. Like, and what I hope to do tonight is show that the historical way and the way that we breathe right now to form identity is wrong. It will fail you and it will leave you desperate. That's what I want to show. And then what I want to do is I want to, I want to come kind of after that and say, listen, this idea that our identity can be found in Christ, that is where our ultimate joy will reside. Because in each one of those examples, what the person or the the main character is trying to do is they're saying, I have to overcome everyone else so I myself can experience ultimate joy. And I believe this fails in two ways. I think, one, it's an illusion, and two, I think it's suffocating. It's an illusion, and it's suffocating. Okay, the first, it's an illusion. is what happens with this is you, you begin to take something who God has ordained as good, because hey, because God will ordain something that's good, like academics, romance, music, movies, athleticism, whatever, status, popularity, power, whatever it is, is those are all morally neutral, are they not? There's nothing wrong with money and popularity and status and academics and all. There's nothing wrong with those. They're morally neutral. And so what we do is with our, our individualism kind of coming in, is we take that, we resonate on this, we, we elevate this above kind of everything else and say, no, if I can just be the smartest, if I'm the smartest in my class, I'm the smartest at my school, then everything will be okay. I will have worth. I will have value. If people just like me, right? And what's terrifying for me is that your generation is one of the first ones that can quantify numerically your worth via social media. For one of the first times ever, you can look and say, well, 320 people like me. Or man, I I took that picture and 500 people like that. That's worth, that's value. Social media is morally neutral. But what happens is when we attach a number onto it, it's unbelievably dangerous because we find our identity and our worth and our followers and our likes and our comments, whatever it is. And if we're not careful, it will destroy us because the illusion is that it is is where your value is. Because let me tell you something. At some point, someone will be smarter than you. Someone will be prettier than you. Someone will have more followers than you. Okay, all of those, whatever it is that you place your identity in, I promise you, at one point, old age is coming, you'll get old, you'll get wrinkly, you'll get fat, and someone will be better than you. Right? Like Michael Jordan right now, okay, he could not beat LeBron James. Right now, he couldn't. Now, in their prime, that's a different story, okay? <laughs> but, but the reality is, is this, is, is, is really, it's an illusion because it depends on what room you're in. Okay, when I'm in my room with my daughter, I'm probably the smartest person in the room. Okay, probably, all right? But when I'm in a seminary class and I'm sitting there with a whole different context, all of a sudden, I'm nothing. Right? Is, is the success, that the ways that we find our identity in things, it's an illusion. It will let you down. It will fail you. I promise. I've lived just a bit longer than you, and it will let you down. Like for me, I went through a huge season where I found my worth and my value in what people thought about me. Like, I needed people 
to tell me, great job, you did good, or whatever it is. Like, I was, I was a huge people pleaser. And so for me, my worth and my value was from people. And so the illusion is, is that what people say about me is where my value and my worth is. But if that's the case, then, man, I am in tremendous trouble because my life is a wreck. Because I can't hold up that image. And so I would project what I thought people would like. And it was like, okay, if I get the people to, to appreciate me, tell me I'm great, whatever it is, if I project that, that's where I'll find my value and worth. But I promise you it'll break down. People will not always do that. You will make enemies. People will dislike you. People will think you're dumb. But because I had elevated that, my whole life kind of came crumbling down. And here's the other, the other reason I think it fails. It's suffocating. It's suffocating because the reality is this, is if you say that what's in me needs to be my identity, whatever my desire is, whether that's safety, security, academics, sex, money, power, whatever it is, is if that inside you, if you say, this is how I find my value and my worth, it's suffocating because it's on you. Because the reality then is when you fail, which you will, whether it's old age that comes and takes your mind so you're no longer sharp enough to be smart, whether it's age and injury, whatever it is, when all of a sudden you've placed your identity in those things, it is suffocating because once you fail, it collapses in on you and no longer did you just fail here, your whole life has crumbled. So if I find my, my worth in, like for instance, significant others make terrible, terrible gods. I love my wife dearly. She is the greatest woman I've ever met. I love her. Okay, but the reality is this, is I could have married someone else and I could have been just as enough. Okay, it's not her. It's our quest to, to love each other. And, and the reality is, is if I place my identity on her or on my daughter, that's not only suffocating to me, it's going to crush them. Because they, they were never intended for this. Right? It's an illusion and it's suffocating. So now what I want to do is, is, is really answer the question, okay, but why? Are our desires bad? And I love this because this is one of my favorite quotes, um, quotes from C.S. Lewis. Hey, C.S. Lewis says this in a book called The Weight of Glory, and I believe that The Weight of Glory should be required reading for all of you in here, and I know you all hate reading right now, but read it anyway, all right? It's a little tiny one. <laughs> all right, here we go. Someone likes it. But C.S. Lewis says this. He said, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased. Okay, what he's pointing at is those desires you have in you to, to be popular, to be smart, to, to, to obtain success, all those things, those are pointing towards a greater reality. That God has said, I give you these things that are morally neutral, that are good. And he says, they don't stop there though. Don't make them identity. Let those well up into joy in Christ. That a good meal, right, is, is, is that, that, that delight we experience and that wells up into joy to the creator of that meal. That our desires are not too strong, but they're too weak. Like sitting in the mud, making mud pies when, when God said, listen, I'll take you out to sea. I'll show you the world. I'll give you everything. But we stop short. We stop short. We let stress overwhelm us. With the pressures of school and a job and a significant other and all that, we let that overwhelm us and we stop short and we say, God, I need more than that because your heart is longing for it. Your heart is desperately longing for more. So we have this passage in, in Philippians I want to look at. And Paul is one of my favorite uh, biblical characters because he, he, uh, he really experienced this. And I, and I want us to, to go through this because Paul is going to make a case. He's going to make a case that he was born with the utmost privilege okay, and that he had achieved everything the world could offer. Okay, so he was born in the right family and he had achieved everything that he could achieve. Okay, and so, so what's happening here is Paul is writing to the Philippians and the Philippians were, were there was these, this group called the Judaizers that were going around and essentially saying all the Gentiles need to be circumcised in order to be saved or be Jewish. And so what Paul's going to do is he's going to say, oh, you want to play the game of who's more Jewish? And he's going to say, I'm the Jew of them all, right? That's what, essentially what he's going to do. That's where he's going to come. So we have this passage up on the screen. Follow along with me in, in uh, Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 4. <clears throat> he says, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh. He says, if anyone else thinks he has uh, reason for, for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin a Hebrew of Hebrews, 
as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Okay, so he starts this passage off. And go back, uh, back a slide to the beginning there if you can. And he goes through this kind of list of things that he has. And I just want to run through them really quickly. He says, circumcised on the eighth day. Okay, that's not something we celebrate much today. Uh, but what he's essentially saying is, is in the Torah, okay, is that that was just, it was a rule, it was a law, that's what you're supposed to do. So Paul's saying, listen, I was born to, fa- to parents, to families that followed and observed the law. He said, from birth, I was born right. Then he goes on, he says, um, of the people of Israel, essentially saying, I am an Israelite through and through. I didn't convert to Jew- Judaism. I was Jewish from birth. And he says, of the tribe of Benjamin, in the tribe of Benjamin, there were two tribes that, that, that were really kind of special in that sense. It was Judah and it was Benjamin. And both Judah and Benjamin, they could trace their lineage all the way back to Abraham. And so Paul, right, his, his name before he became Paul was Saul. And Saul is the namesake for King Saul. And so for, for what he's saying here is he's saying, I can trace my lineage all the way back through Saul, who I'm named after, all the way back, right, to, to Abraham. It's like the beginning. He's saying, I was an Israelite through and through. Like, through and through, I was, I was there. I was, I was what you would expect. And then he says this interesting one, and this is really kind of a transition piece. Okay, because the first three, the three I just described, those are all about his birthright. His privilege. Then he says, he says, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He's like, I am a man among men. Right? He's saying, like, no matter what, through and through, I was that. And so now he transitions and he's going to describe things that he's done. Okay? So he says, as to the law of Pharisee. Right? So he was in, like, the ruling party before he encountered Christ. He says, as for the law of Pharisee, he says he knew the scriptures, he knew Torah inside and out. He says, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. He's saying, I wanted to protect Israel so much that when this Jesus movement welled up, I just started murdering people who were challenging Israel. All right, then he goes on. He says, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Okay, some of your translations might say perfect. And a lot of people get tripped up on this, but essentially what he's saying is I hold the Torah so well that on the, on the rare occasion I screw up, I make sure to go through the process of sacrifice, sacrifice and make sure I'm good and clean now and blameless. Okay, so here's Paul. He's a man who says, I've accomplished everything. I was born into the right family. I've accomplished everything this world has to offer. I've ascended to a sort of status where I had everything. Like absolutely everything. Okay, but what he says on the next passage, he says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. And what he's using here is he's using accounting language. And so he's, he's, he's saying essentially whatever was in my gain column, the things that were adding money and value and worth and whatever was added there, he says, I had those things in them. I had all these qualifications. I have ascended to a status. I had the most followers. I was the most athletic. I had the greatest grades. He says, all those things, those were in my gain column, but then I encountered Christ. He says, then I was walking on a road to Damascus and Jesus, the resurrected king, encountered me and everything was put into a new perspective. Right, like everything changed. He says, everything that was gain, whatever was in that column that I thought was providing life, that I thought was giving me worth, that I thought was giving me value, everything there moved to the lost column. He said, everything. Because I think what he's getting at, right, is if we go back to saying that it's an illusion and it's suffocating, that those things we put our identity in, that if we go back to those, what Jesus offers is an identity that is sure, that is lasting, that's steady, that's durable. Right? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's here's a guy in Jesus who says, listen, I created the world. I hold, Colossians says, he holds the world in his hands. He sustains it. And he says, that, that God that sustains the world looks at you, calls you son or daughter, and says you are beloved. Right? He says, he says when, he, when, I, when I looked at that God who encountered me, 
who saw me, he said, there was nothing I could do to, to resist that. There's nothing I could do that made me like, have worth and value other than embracing Jesus. Everything that was gained is now loss. Right? And, and I love this passage because you can almost hear Paul's like, passion in as, as he writes this. He says, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He repeats it. And I love that phrase, my Lord. And I think that's really important is he's saying that, that it's no longer just this ethereal idea, but it's my Lord. It's intimate. Right? It's an intimate knowledge. So he goes on and he says, for, uh, for his sake I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Okay, that word okay, is skubalon, is what it is in Greek. And skubalon is the closest we get to an expletive in the scriptures. Okay, I would tell you what it is, but I might get the skubalon beat out of me. Um, okay, there you go. All right, good. <laughs> so it's uh, essentially what he's, he's getting at. He's saying, listen, I took everything the world had to offer. I placed Jesus here. And he said, listen, I, it didn't mean anything anymore. He says, I gave it up. It was garbage. It was trash. It was dung. It was excrement compared to knowing Jesus. He says, it's rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. He says, the righteousness of God. The left phrase, in, found in, because essentially what he's saying is that one day, in the, in the, the, in the Greek, the tense is present and future. Okay, so he's essentially saying that right now, I stand before God as righteous because of Jesus. But then one day I'll stand in judgment before God. And he says, even then, God will look at me and he'll see Jesus. He'll look at me, he'll see the righteousness of Jesus. He won't see the times I place my identity in this, this, or that. Because that will collapse. It will, it'll, it'll, it'll suffocate us. It will drown us. It will crush us under his weight. Instead, we need something that's lasting, that's, that's durable, and we need Jesus. He is what will sustain us. All right, and then he goes on, he says, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection of the dead. Okay, Paul knew something about the resurrection, and resurrection isn't heaven. Okay, we got to get past that. It's so much more than that. Resurrection is this idea that one day the, the heavens and the earth will be reunited together, and that is new creation. That in new creation, Revelation 21, 1 through 4, one of my favorite passages because it says that one day the heavens and the earth will be reunited. There'll be no more tears. There'll be no more sickness, no more cancer, no more gossip, no more hate, no more pain. He says it'll be made new. It'll be made fresh. And for Paul, he says, I need that identity so I can achieve resurrection. That resurrection is my hope. Resurrection is my joy. But what Paul also knew, that resurrection is only on the other side of death. So for you guys tonight, there are ways where either your identity is suffocating you or the world, the brokenness of the world around us is suffocating us. There is death. It's very real. There's pain. There's hurt. There's tears. There's sadness. There's sickness. There's all of that. What Paul says is, listen, it's there now in your face, but on the other side of it is resurrection. For Jesus, he couldn't get to resurrection without going through the cross. And the cross is when he takes that pain, when he takes that suffering, when he takes that hurt and the brokenness of the world, and it says that it's, it's placed on him so that you may have resurrection. It says if death came to one man, life comes through him too. So church, Jessup, what we need is that resurrection. For Paul, this propels him through unbelievable suffering, right? Is this identity rooted in Christ is what propels him beyond so many other kind of obstacles, All right? I want to just read this list of, of, of sufferings that Paul endures because Paul was a guy who went through more than I think most of us can understand. And I've always struggled with this because I think, how in the world did Paul get through this? How did he endure so many of these hardships? Because again, I know they're in this room. Right, as we were, we were meeting with the leaders before and praying, there was just this sense that you guys are just hurting, that there's stress and there's pressure that's just overwhelming you guys. You're coming out of midterms, you're getting close to the end, but it's difficult. There's family situations, there's pain, there's hurt, and what you need is resurrection. You don't need to run to that other identity you've placed it. You need the joy of Christ in the suffering. So listen to what Paul's gone through. It's 2 Corinthians 11, verse 24. 
He says five times, or he says, uh, yeah, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods when I was stoned. He says three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger of, of rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. It says in toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and in thirst, and often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure of my anxiety for all the churches. And I read that, and I I, I want you to hear me. I'm not saying, look what he went through. How dare you struggle with yours? But I want you to see that the identity that Paul had endured those things. The identity of Jesus the life he is offering you to say, listen, you are my beloved son and daughter. And to root yourself in that is to say, no matter the hardship that comes, if I root myself in Christ, it will not, life will not necessarily be what I imagined, but it will be good. I will have joy and I'll be able to endure those things. In chapter 4 in, in 2 Corinthians, Paul goes on to say about those sort of sufferings, he says, they are light and momentary. It says, when I place them next to eternity, when I place them next to resurrection, the sufferings I endure now are light and momentary. As this is the identity your heart is desperately seeking. That where your heart is searching for it in others, in that, that significant other, in academics, in safety, in success, in money, in popularity, whatever it is, wherever your heart is drawn, and our hearts are drawn away from God, they are. But wherever they're drawn, what what God is offering is saying, listen, lay it before me. Bring it before Jesus and let your identity be rooted in him because that is where your ultimate joy is. That is where your hope is. It's in Jesus. It's in resurrection. It's not in death. It's whatever those things are, lay them down. I want to end with one story that Jesus tells in Matthew 13. And in Matthew 13, he, he talks about this man who's walking across this field and he stumbles across a treasure. Okay, and, and this was pretty common back then. There weren't necessarily banks or whatnot, and so a lot of people would just bury their treasure. And if they died before they could recover it, it essentially became public domain. And so Jesus is, is telling this story, and this guy walks across this treasure. He stumbles across it, and it says, in his joy, he goes and he sells everything so he can buy the whole field. Okay, and historically, we read that, and we think, man, I don't want to give up everything. Right? And we read that, and we're like, i got to go sell everything? I think what happens is we misread it, because the story is not at all about what he gave up. It's about what he found. That the story is about the treasure, the kingdom of God, what Jesus offers. He says, I found that, and when I found that, I had everything. That was my hope. That was my joy. When I came across the treasure, I say, I'll give up anything I have to for this. That's what I will, like, when I have that, I have everything. When I have that, my heart is satisfied. When I have that, my heart is full. I'm satisfied. I have joy. I have hope that can endure the good times and the bad, the successes and the failures. I need that. That is where our joy is. So, Jessup, my hope tonight is that, that you wrestle with that. Where's your heart being pulled away? Where are you placing your identity in something that's an illusion and it's suffocating you? Where are you placing something in the, in, in, in the position that God needs for you to have that, that strength and that courage to carry on? Because nothing will satisfy your heart but Jesus. Nothing will endure. So I'm going to pray here in a moment, and I, I want to challenge you guys to be thinking, what is that thing? Most likely you know what it is. And most likely you know, without having to think real hard, where it is that you find value and worth. And I just want to come alongside you and say, listen, it's going to hurt you. It's not Jesus. It's going to hurt you. It will let you down. Find joy. Find rest in Jesus. Because he is your hope. He is your joy. He is your ultimate identity. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he is a good, good, good father. He will guide you. So will you bow your heads and just have a moment of silence with me?